Good morning, my friend. I hope you're doing well. It is Tuesday morning. You are hearing this. If you're hearing it on Tuesday, it is April 18th, 2023, and I am so excited. It's not Tuesdays with Tata this week, okay? We're making a very rare exception to the Tuesdays with Tata format, and today we are bringing you a conversation that I have with my dear friend Addison Bevere. Addison, of course, is a writer, um, and he is a chief operating officer of Messenger International. You've heard me talk about Messenger on the podcast many times, an organization that provides ministry resources to millions of people in 150 countries around the world. Addison is in the Nashville area with his wife and four beautiful children. And Addison has written uh, a book that I think is um, really one of the most important books I've ever read. I I, uh, try to use, I try to avoid the use of hyperbole uh, in my life. I, I like to joke and use exaggerations and all that in my jokes. But when I'm telling you about something that can help you, I try to, to be really crystal clear on what the benefit is. Just like in medicine, I don't ever want to overstate what my surgery can do or can offer to someone or what a medication can be expected to perform. I want you to know exactly what you're getting into. And with Addison's new book, which is called Words with God, Trading Boring, Empty Prayer for Real Connection, you're going to find some big answers to some questions you may have had, like what do we do with unanswered prayers and how do we move through them? Why does God invite us to ask through prayer if he is aware of our needs already? We have those these honest questions, right? If God already knows everything, why does it matter if I ask him? Well, he's already decided what he's going to do. Well, you need to address that, and Addison's book does it. Is there a right way to pray? How often do we? How often do we need to pray? What does it look like when when the Bible says pray without ceasing? What does that mean in our busy lives? How do we learn to hear the voice of God God, and how do we know it's not just our own brain chemistry, right? I know a lot of people that understand that we have this voice in our head and they don't understand. When am I hearing from God? When am I hearing from the devil? When am I just hearing my own wishes and desires? And, And we're just tired of this boring, empty prayer or this thing that seems insurmountable, this impossibility to get out of the noise of our lives and get into a real conversation. And if God says that prayer is the secret to getting to know him, how do we do it? It feels frustrating and hopeless at times. And I'm going to tell you this. There's two books that I've read in my life that really changed the the compass of what I thought the direction I needed my prayer life to go. One was Richard Foster's book on prayer, which the subtitle was Finding the the Heart's True Home. And the other was my friend Philip Yancey's book, Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference? That's a big question I had in my life. And Addison has written a book that's going to sit on my shelf right next to those two monumental works on prayer. Words with God is one of those books that's going to change the direction for you, friend. I'm not kidding. Um, I did an endorsement. I'm I'm incredibly honored that Addison asked me to endorse his book. Um, He he is um, just an unbelievable young man who's doing great things for the kingdom. And he reached out and he said, hey, I've written a new book. (laughs) He provided me with the a PDF copy a few months ago. And it was just, it hit me at just the right time when I was actually struggling with some things in prayer. I was having some, some difficulty finding some answers that we needed. And, and this book came, I think I got it on a Friday afternoon, got up early as I always do on Saturday morning. And Addison just completely wrecked my plans for the day because I read his entire book that morning. Lisa got up and was like, what are you doing? I said, I'm nothing except reading this book. I'm, I just got to read it. And, and so I, I, was humbled that he asked me to endorse the book. And, and here's what I said, Addison, when Addison asked me to endorse his book, here's what I sent him. And here's what ended up in the front uh, few pages of his book. Here's what I said. As he so often does, God placed my friend Addison Bevere's book, Words with God, in my inbox exactly when I needed it most. In a quiet and dry season in my prayer life, when God's voice feels drowned out by life's frenzied pace, Addison has equipped me to learn to hear again. My bookcase contains many treasured guides I've used to reconnect when God, to God when prayer seems hard or ineffective, including my favorites by Philip Yancey and Richard Foster. But Addison has done more than just give us a book on prayer. He walks alongside those of us who are struggling, pastoring and mentoring us through our doubts and fears into real connection and conversations with God. I'll return to words with God's many times in the years to come, as it has already been so helpful to me. He asked me for my endorsement as a favor to him, but Addison's book is a favor to us all. Listen, friend, without hyperbole, I can tell you that Addison's book, Words with God, will make a difference in your prayer life. And if you feel alone in this world, if you feel like nothing's changing, when you're begging for change, when you feel like things are dry and you you 
can't even quiet the voices in your own head to begin to wonder how to learn to discern and hear God's voice. Addison's book will help you. We're going to give away two copies. The first two listeners that write in, Lee at DrLeeWarren.com, we're going to, the publisher has agreed to send two copies of the book. So shoot me an email, Lee at DrLeeWarren.com, with your name and mailing address, and we will get you a copy of Addison's book, the first two listeners that write in. Listen, this is a game changer. It's always a wonderful, fun time when I get a chance to talk to Addison. We had a wonderful conversation, close to an hour long. I think you'll get a lot out of it, but I want you to go and get this book, okay? It's not very expensive. You can get it on Amazon or from any bookseller. Don't forget to support your local booksellers. This is one I'm telling you, friend, you need to get this book. It's going to help you. Okay. It's going to make a difference for you. And without hyperbole, Addison's book is my, in my top three books on prayer that I've read in my entire life. And I'm going to read it again and again. I've already got two copies, one for Lisa and one for Tata. It comes out today. So go grab it, download it. The, the audio book is going to be amazing because Addison uh, narrated himself, which is always a, just a treat when the author takes the time to narrate the book in their own voice. So that's useful. If you like audio books, go check it out. Words with God, trading boring, empty prayer for real connection. And I'm so excited to bring my friend Addison Bevere to you today because I'm always telling you, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And changing your mind about prayer will make a huge difference in your life and in your family's life and your generations after you and everything that you do. The good news is you can start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is you can start today. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you'd like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. Well, friend, we're back, and I'm so excited uh, to bring you back a friend who's been on the show once before back in February on my birthday in 2020, actually. Uh, Addison Bevere is here with us today. Hey, Addison. Hey, Dr. Lee. It's good to be back on the show. It's good to see your face. That's good to see your face. It's been too long. It has been too long. It's been a long time. And I I was just remembering this morning that we met in the green room Mm -hmm. at Cornerstone Church in San Antonio. We were were both on a a live event with the Hagees and great, you know, great ministers that they have. And, um, there was this handsome young man sitting across the green room from us, and and Lisa said, "Hey, we got to go introduce ourselves to that guy." And, and uh, turned out to be Addison Bevere. We we became friends, and and um, we did. Do you remember what I did? You, you called your mom. It was so funny. I was reading one of your mom's books, and you said your name, and I was like, "That's not a very common name." Are you are you by any chance kin to Lisa and John Bevere? And you were like, "Yeah, let me call my mom." <laughs> And then I remember I handed you my phone while, because I was going first on the show and I left. Did I leave my phone with you? Yeah. Yeah. You like walked out of the room. I'm talking to your mom on the phone. It's hilarious. <laughs> and they've become such, uh, we've, yeah. we've kind of gotten involved with Messenger and, and, and your dad has, has been just very kind to me. You guys have been great. So, um, it's been one of those God relationships and we're grateful, um, grateful for it. We are too. So grateful. So you are currently at the beach. You're in Florida or somewhere? Or? I am. I am uh, at the guy. beach. Yeah. It's I'm a, so sorry. It's, it's rough. You know, we we were we were fortunate. We drove down a few days ago. We drove seven hours, kids in the car, and they were troopers to get down here for a few days. It's so beautiful. We had to we had to get out of that that Tennessee rain for a bit. So yeah, we're here yeah. for a few days. We've been praying, the whole uh, family actually. That's that's awesome. Got the all the uncles, aunts, wow, everyone. We're all here together. Good family trip. That's that's important. And we've been praying for Nashville and all the all the trouble that y'all have had there in your community with the the shooting. And um, 
just uh, this world is not our home, man. It's just a tough, no. it's a tough, tough time. But but you've got something for us, Ad- Addison, that I think um, is a little bit of hope that we can grab onto and a tool that we can use that, that is really um, for some of us a, a struggle in our Christian walk. Uh, and you've written an incredible new book called Words with God: Trading Boring Empty Prayer for Real Connections. You've written a book about prayer, and um, it, it, it's incredible, and I'm excited to share it with my audience today, the listeners out there all over the world. 108 countries downloaded wow. the podcast last week, so people all over the world are going to get some some good news from Addison Bevere today. But before we start, would you uh, would you just start with some words from God, words with God for us? Yeah, absolutely. Now, Father, we thank you for the invitation to have words with you. Um, we thank you that we're invited to be part of, of a conversation that you speak to us in both silence and in sound. And right now we take a a moment to pause, to take a deep breath and remember the promise that you are with us, that you are for us. And even in the absence, you are inviting us closer, the perceived absence, you're inviting us closer to you. And I pray that wherever we find ourselves today, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts and our lives, that you would open us to the reality of who you are so that we can have words with you and have the words that we need to have in this world today, God, I pray that the comfort of the Spirit be with us and guide us as we move through this conversation. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you. That's that's yes, a sir. perfect place to start, Addison. Um, you you tell us in the book as you're getting started, right at the start of chapter two, the genesis of this book was a season in your life when you were pretty stressed out and you were struggling. Yeah. And just give us a give us kind of a high level look at what was happening in your world and, and what happened that led to you deciding to write a book about prayer. That's a, that's a big task. I'm going to write a book to help people understand how to pray. That's a, that's a big task. Talk to us about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll be honest with you. This is a book that I never thought I would write. Uh, I, I spent almost five years navigating insomnia. Um, wow. I had a lot of things happen in my life during this period And I allowed myself to spiral. And I was given over to a lot of um, nighttime anxiety. I couldn't fall asleep. And then um, when I could fall asleep, I would wake up and I, I I would just feel like there were so many things that were out of my control. And um, it drove me to this place of sleeplessness where I traded these hours at night for, for some form of productivity. Wow. And um, it became became a habit for me, um, and I lived in a perpetual fog. And I was I was pretty good at hiding it um, from most people, but you know you can't hide something like that from from your spouse. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one one morning, Julie she called me. And she was just like, "Listen, you're not going anywhere." Like I felt like that particular day, I felt like my bodily systems were all shutting down. It just felt mm-hmm. like I couldn't do anything. Um, and she's like, you're not going anywhere. You're not doing anything. The world's going to have to spin without your contribution. Um, and yeah, you're just, you need to go get alone with God, whatever. Uh, like you can go wherever you want, but you're not going to work today. And so it was a breaking point for me. And I, I went away, um, actually to garden of the gods that day in Colorado Springs. Wow. I went away and I spent, I spent about five, six hours in prayer, just really like yelling, really probably yelling majority majority of the time yelling at God, just like, God, what in the world is going on? Like, how, why do I find myself in this place? I feel like I, I've been faithful to my family. I feel like I've been faithful to what you called me to do. Um, I love my wife. I, I, I feel, I feel like I'm pursuing you the way I know how to pursue you. Yeah. And during this time, Dr. Lee, it just felt like in my pursuit of God, there was nothing. Like I was yelling into a canyon. Like I was reaching out for someone who wasn't there. And so I was getting frustrated with God. Like, God, why have you abandoned me? I just, I, it didn't add up for me. Wow. And so during that time, I, I felt this invitation to go away um, for the first time in my life and do, do a time of stillness and silence. And so I, I, I kind of made this deal with God. I'm like, God, if you get me through the next few months, I'm going to do this. Right? If you give me the grace yeah. to get me through the next few months, because really I couldn't do it before then for various reasons. And so I did. And it was the first time, and I share this in, in detail in the book, but it was the first time that I, I went to bed like normal people do. That's that's how I described it. Yeah. I had such an intense nighttime routine. I mean, it was OCD to the max, the things that I would do to have to create the right environment for me to sleep. But based on my sleep patterns, none of that was working. Um, but I read Psalm 127 that night, and it struck me 
what it says about it's in vain that you stay up late and you get up early eating the bread of anxious toil. And I realized that I had been feeding, uh, feeding myself uh, the bread of anxious toil. And there is a form wow. of sustenance. There's an illusion of sustenance that comes with the bread of anxious toil. And it struck me. And I had, I went to bed at like, I don't know, seven thirty, eight o'clock the night. And I slept for 11 hours. And that was wow. something that hadn't happened in years. And I woke and as I was waking, there was this holy invitation on my lips. I don't know how to describe it. I really haven't experienced anything like it before or since then. And what I, what I, what I sensed and what I articulated as I woke was essentially the message that prayer is going to become the center of your life and you're going to write on it. Wow. And it's like, well, essentially it was an invitation. It felt like a statement, but it was more of an invitation to accept that, to believe it, to be true. And I remember saying yes but really not knowing that I was saying yes. It was, it was almost, it's like that, the verse of Philippians 2, it talks about the will to do his will. It's like yeah. God intervened and, and was empowering my will to say yes to his will. That's what it felt like. And, uh, and then I moved, I was like, man, as I woke up, I'm like, man, this is another form of grasping. Like I, I come from a family of writers. Like I, I do write. I'm like, oh, you know, this is another play at productivity. Yeah. But, it just would not wash away. And I, I'll leave the rest for the, the story of the book, and you, but yeah. you know what happens then. But I, God meets me in a miraculous way that day, specifically that day, um, through the life of another person and through a prayer that I prayed. And it became, it became the catalyst for this book. And it set me into a, um, I mean, years, years of working on it and also writing it in order to, to be where we are today. So, wow, that's a bit of the story. That's it's it's incredible, and and the way that God calls us to things, it's 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 not always because of our prior qualifications, right? I mean, the Bible's mm -hmm. full of stories like that, but you know, Gideon and different people that are like, "This is not your thing, but it's going to become your thing if you let me equip you for it." And yeah. that's what you've done here. It's it's beautiful. And you said you told a little um a little story about this guy Ivan, and you're gonna. I don't want to give the whole thing away, but but you're right. I mean, God put an individual person in your path who kind of called that you day. out of, yeah, that very day. Um, and it was interesting that morning, because to be more specific that morning, <laughs> right, right after the thing. But what was interesting to me is that, that it, there was a little bit of a, a, a double edge to it because he was mm -hmm. dying of cancer and you feel like you're getting called to pray into his life and God's going to do some miraculous thing for him, but it didn't work out that way. Yeah, and, and what was amazing about it too, Dr. Lee, is the way all of it was so providential leading to that moment. I mean, we 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 talked for four hours, uh, prayed together, laid hands on him, there were tears, and then it moved into something over the next couple of days where families ended up getting connecting and all of these things. And it was just like, God, this is so apparent. This is how you're moving. This is this is how you're meeting us. And and as I as I write about in the book, but during these during these five years, I really felt abandoned by God. I wasn't experiencing the tangible presence of God. Yeah. I, I would pray, I would read, I would, I would chase God, but I felt like God was incredibly elusive during this time. And it was during that, that season, Dr. Lee, where I discovered that when it comes to prayer, like silence is not rejection. It's actually an invitation. Right. It's an invitation to let go of preconceived ideas of God and prayer and how all this works. And I feel like in that moment with Ivan specifically, like it was a moment where I had this preconceived idea of what saying yes to a more robust and more complete and more whole revelation of prayer would look like and to write on. And the spirit of God led me down a direction of surrender and um, facing off with with doubts that I had that I didn't even realize I had that I needed to face off with. And I write, and I write about this in the book, but there's a big difference between doubt and unbelief. And yep. when we, when we, as the people of God, when we're willing as the children of God, we bring our doubts to the father. It's kind of like God and I sit down, we sat down together. We looked at these doubts on the shelf. We lined them out on the shelf and we got to have a good conversation about them. But so often we hide our doubts. We hide our dissonance from God, thinking that, he, in, in some form or fashion, can't handle that. But it's so clear. I mean, the psalmist tells in Psalm 142, I was just reading it this earlier today, but it says, 
the psalmist is talking about David saying, I lay out my complaints before God. Yep. And what I tell people is, look, when it comes to your dynamic with God, don't complain about God, but complain to God. Because people, you know, they think they think of children of Israel complaining and they don't inherit the promised land. And, and I get that. But there's something that happens when we complain to God, directly to him. That's right. we, we are forced to face off with these ideas of who God is and how he works and what that means for our lives and what that means for purpose and calling and relationship and all the things that are super meaningful. And it, it leads us on a journey into truth that, that goes so far beyond the cliches that and, that we largely build our lives on. That's exactly right. It's it's such a crucial distinction because I think we're taught, or maybe we just absorb that that this idea that doubt is equal to disbelief or unfaithfulness. And I mean, the Bible's full of stories about people who bring their doubts faithfully to God. Yes, you you, you drilled into that just a little bit about what disbelief is. Disbelief mm-hmm. is, I think you said, the belief that God can't do the things that He says He can do. Or something to that effect. And what's that? Yeah. How's that compared to doubt? A doubt is that he may not do them, right? Yeah. So the way the way I make the distinction is doubt more so has to do with our perception of God. So like we right. doubt how, where, who will do it. Um, unbelief is like God, God's not going to do it. So unbelief is more tied to doubting the person of God. Right. Uh, whereas doubt is more, more tied into like how God will work when he will move and stuff like that. And you see that in Abraham. I mean, Abraham's called in Romans 5, he's called the father of faith. And you know that man doubted. I mean, he yep. gave his wife to two other men. He he uh, birthed an heir in his own power. I mean, he yep. his life was was a colorful one for sure. And I would say his life was in many ways movements through doubt. And yet he's defined as the father of faith. Mm-hmm. And Paul makes the statement that he was not given to unbelief. So there, there's a distinction there. And I think it's in prayer that we learn to discern the difference between those two. That's right. You talk about the voice that we hear in our head. Um, and yeah. you start with this, this metaphor of being in the canyon. It was not a metaphor for you. You were in the canyon. Um, mm-hmm. And these echoes that we hear in our heads. And, and talk about that a little bit, because I think all of us have that. You laid it out really nicely. All of us have this idea sometimes or fear are we really hearing God's voice? Are we hearing our own brain chemistry? Yeah. What are we, what are we hearing in our head? And how do we know it's not the enemy? Like what, what do we know? And how do we, how do we learn to hear the voice? Yeah. Yeah. As, as you mentioned, the first movement of the book, it, the first three chapters is called the Canyon, right? Chapter one yeah. is called the voice. The first movement is the Canyon. The second movement is the temple. And the third movement is the dance. And these represent, they're not just linear, although often we find ourselves moving through this progression in life. But but I view these as three like three dimensions to how we engage with God through prayer. Um, but but the first one with the canyon and this idea of the voice, I, I think many of us, Doctor Lee, I think we struggle to hear the voice of God, to discern the voice of God, because we look for God's voice in the tone and the tenor of the accuser. Yeah. We we expect God to communicate to us and with us. Um, in, in a way that is, is largely like the loud and the, the persistent voice over our lives in so many ways, which is um, a byproduct of the broken world that we live in and the, 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 the broken um, parts of who we are, our makeup. Uh, and so one of the reasons why I think prayer so often leads us into silence is because we have to unlearn the voice of the accuser. Like yeah. we're, we have to move through that silence in order to recognize that that's not how God communicates with us. And as we move through the silence, we start to realize that prayer is not transactional. It's not singular, that, that God really does want to open the conversation. God wants to have words with us, not just when we're on our knees or in the closet, like God wants to speak to us through silence and in sound. And I, and I yeah. make the, the statement at the end of chapter one, that even in the Canyon's echo, the voice speaks, we start to realize as we, as we grow in communion and intimacy with God, we start to realize that even our voice, as it matures and grows, becomes a reflection of the voice of God, which is, which is inc- like when you really start to understand that and break that down and you get into statements that Paul makes and first Corinthians two and three, two, where he's talking about the idea of it's the spirit of a man that searches, understands the depths of the man. First Corinthians three, where he makes a statement that we are God's temple. 
Like yeah. God's temple, this is this is where God is doing business. This is a microcosm where heaven is touching right. earth. Like this is this is radical stuff. But I think one of the reasons why, Dr. Lee, we struggle with prayer. And if people are honest, like I mean, I'll be honest. And <laughs> from every person who I've engaged with, this has been the response. Like secretly, I struggle with prayer, but I feel like I can't tell people that I struggle with prayer because it's one of those things, like I'm so far along in my journey, I should know how to do this. And so I, I don't even want to be honest about the fact that I'm, I struggle with prayer, but I, I fully, like, that's what I hear from people, but I fully believe the reason why we struggle with prayer is because we're aiming for the wrong target. Wow. Like, I, I, I think we're running in the wrong direction, aiming for the wrong target. Use whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, we view prayer as a formula or a problem to solve right. and not a conversation or an experience to share. And so for so many of us, Prayer remains at arm's length. And that's why even with how we hear the voice of God, in some ways, we push that away and keep it at arm's length instead of realizing, and I quote the theologian Karl Barth, he has a great statement I put it in chapter one about that resonance between God's voice and the voice that is forming and growing and who we are as sons and daughters of God. And that's, that's scary stuff. That's a land of certainty and mystery. Um, but that's a space where we are deeply formed and we start to understand what this is all about. That's, that's powerful stuff. And there's, there's some, some fear, I think, in approaching, I mean, the God of the universe in a relational way. Right. So, I mean, we, it's easy, it's easy to have transactional relationship. Mm -hmm. God, I need this. God, I need that. God do this. Don't do that. Um, it's hard when it's relationship because he might ask you to change, right? He might ask you to Dude, write a book about prayer. <laughs> and the and the thing, yeah, it's it's so true. And then every everything about God is relational. We have to realize that God is first and foremost relational. Um, that's that's one of the great mysteries of of the Trinity, the triune nature of God. And as as we move into that reality, as we realize, man, like there's nothing off limits. Like that's what the writer of Hebrews is getting at in Hebrews four, where where the writer talks about the, the word of God piercing and dividing between marrow and spirit or yeah. between um, soul and spirit, bone and marrow. Like that's not a, we read that sometimes, especially because of the way we, um, we break up that pack, that passage, but we read that as this is a negative thing. Like God's coming to judge, but really what, what the writer of Hebrews is describing is that we have this high priest who's incredibly sympathetic and aware, like the lie of the separation that we so often believe and engage with, like that does not have to set the terms of how we engage with God. And I think about Jesus, right? We're, we're recording this on good Friday, right? So this is really like relevant to me today. And it's, it's, it's on my heart heavily today, but I I think about the words that, that Jesus cried um, where, and and he's quoting Psalm 22 verse one, where my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I was thinking about what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter two and chapter four about how Jesus can sympathize with us because the fact that he's navigated temptations, like he's navigated um, the, the, the fracture and the frustration that comes with sin being a part of this world. Like he's navigated that he's seen it. He's experienced its effects. Yeah. And he had to learn obedience. Yeah. 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 Which is, which is a radical, like, I mean, when you really think about that, it's a, it's a radical statement, but tying all that together, it hit me one day, Dr. Lee, as I was meditating on Psalm 22, in order for Jesus to really understand the human experience, he would have to journey through perceived separation because I believe that the greatest temptation, the greatest temptation that we face, greatest temptation is the belief that God has abandoned us. Wow. I believe it is the greatest because if you if you really believe that what you will do to try to find some form of connection or fulfillment or purpose or give give over you'll give yourself over to idolatry or something else like I really believe like even look at the accuser with Adam and Eve no God's actually keeping something from you like there's something mm-hmm. that is pulled away there's a part of him that you're not experiencing that you're not um, that you don't get to share in. And so I was meditating through Psalm 22. And I was like, man, Jesus, he, he even had to experience that. And I'm not getting into theories of atonement or anything like that, but he had to navigate that separation. But what's amazing to me is later in Psalm 22, the statement is made that God does not abandon the afflicted in That's their right. affliction. 
And so he had to move through that and realize even in the distance, even in the silence, even in the separation, what Paul writes in Romans 8 is indeed true. Height, depth, heaven, hell, angel, demon, like nothing is keeping us, separating us from the love of God. And so as, as we move through the pain and the disappointment and the disorientation that comes with prayer, like let's just be honest, and the inadequacy, we have this incredible example and also invitation that God wants to meet us there in ways that move us beyond and outside of the cheap transactional prayer that mm-hmm. is so typical of religion and a religious system where if I do X, God does Y, That's right. which is really just a clever way to manipulate God into doing whatever we think That's God right. should do instead of surrendering our lives um, to, to what he knows about us and what he knows about this world. Wow. That's, a, you know, it's, it's an incredible thought. And Jesus had to learn the neurochemical fact that, that feelings aren't facts. Like you can mm. feel something that doesn't make it true. And I mean, the, the Psalms are full of that. Where can I go and not yes. find your spirit? I can't even go to Sheol to the depths and you're not there. Like it, it, we, we feel it, but it's no. not true. And so that comes back no. to this, this idea that you said about the accuser. I want to be really clear for our listener here the the culture right now, especially wants to downplay the fact that you have an enemy of your soul, like the, 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 this idea that there's really a devil, a really an enemy that doesn't want you to find life and, and fulfillment and abundance, That's but right. it, but it's real. You really do have an accuser. Talk about the accuser's voice for a minute, Addison. Yeah, I will. I would say just look at our world and you will see the effects of accusation. Um, yep. When we, when we listen to the voice of the accuser, we look to accuse, we look to vilify. Um, and if you look at really anywhere where we navigate our differences or navigate tension, largely the voice of the accuser is the one, di- the voice of the accuser is the one dictating the tone. And I believe that is yeah. because of what we're hearing internally. And because we hear that internally, we are projecting that externally. And we live in a world, and Dr. Lee, you know this, where people are afraid of silence. They're afraid of yeah. stillness. They're afraid to engage with God in that respect, which is which is very countercultural. Like we live in, in a world that, um, that is noisy, that is distracting. Definitely. And I think the accuser doesn't want us to engage with God in the stillness and the silence and in that holy trust, because the accuser knows that we're going to find a peace, a confidence, a clarity, a power, a boldness there that we will not find amidst the chaos and confusion of our world. But what the accuser will do, and this is a really simple way, for y'all to discern, like, is this the accuser's voice or is this the leading of the spirit, the voice of God? Uh, the accuser will, will come in, will condemn, will mm-hmm. shame you, will belittle you, will stall you, will freeze you, or will move you into what I call frantic inaction, where your life, where your energy, where your work has very little fruit um, because it's a response against something, not moving forward in faith and hope. Um, and people will be like, well, you know, Addison, hold on. You're saying God's not going to challenge me? No, that's absolutely not. I would actually say that the voice of God has a weightiness to it that the voice of the accuser does not. And there's a gravity, there's a gravitas, there's a seriousness to it because it speaks into the depths of who we are. But something that you'll always find with the voice of God is it will move you forward into faith, into hope, into dependence on God. It will move you out from um, this like self-centered life where all you can see is the universe that you created within. It'll open your eyes to an other's orientation, to a greater world, to purpose, um, to promise. Like That's how God moves through our lives wow. and in our lives. And so understanding that is really helpful and really important because God is going to challenge you. Like God will push you outside of your comfort zone 100%. Um, but the thing is, with, with the voice of God, it's always leading us into something that requires us to take our eyes off ourselves and fix wow. our eyes on the reality, the example of Jesus. Now, Paul describes this as the mind of Christ in 1 Corinthians 2. Yeah. And Jesus is the one who is the intersection of what is most true about us, meaning what we're promised, what we're capable of in him, and what is ultimately true about God. 
That is why we follow Jesus. That is why we believe in Jesus. That is why his name is the name above anything else. And as we surrender to the reality of who Jesus is, the accuser's voice loses power and authority. I mean, think about this. Jesus has beloved sonship spoken over him, right? Moment of baptism. And immediately the spirit of God leads the son to the wilderness. What is the first thing that the accuser says? If you're really the son of God. Yep. If you I mean, come on. And I know y'all have heard this. If you're really called, if you're really this, if you're really that, do something practical. Yep. Do something spectacular. Make something happen. There's this angst to it. There's this response. And Jesus, what does he do? He responds from this place of confidence and rest. And he responds with the word. And he says, wow. it is written. This is my confidence. I'm responding from this confidence that I am beloved. And that's why I feel like we keep going to Hebrews. And that's just because it's Good Friday and I'm in yeah. Hebrews. Um, yeah. But that's why so much of Hebrews is about confident. Like be confident, confidently approach the, the throne of grace. We find mercy and grace in our time of need. And I write about this in chapter 10 of the book, the idea of the conscience and, and how the conscience should be God conscious like it should be oriented in god consciousness because we live in a world that weaponizes the conscience we live in a world of weaponized morality and we have to be aware that if we want to be people who live lives in a way that reflects god's nature we have to be people who live with a god consciousness only then can we have our consciences properly oriented and in tune to navigate the the craziness of the world that we find ourselves in Wow, there's a whole theology right there. <laughs> we can we can have a whole conversation about that. I, I love it. I love this idea, and it's so important, friend. Hearing this, it's so important to get this idea that prayer gives us this opportunity to 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 move away from ourselves and move towards something that will enable us to really be who we're supposed to be, to called yes. to be. And, and you said it beautifully. You said what we don't die to. What we don't die to, we die from, right? So if we don't, yeah. if, if if we don't learn how to to pursue the voice that leads us up and not just back to ourselves, then then we're going to die from that, and it's going to be the thing that takes us out. You you had this beautiful line about Jesus describing truth as the rock, right? You either throw yourself on the rock, or the rock's going to fall on you. <laughs> yeah, but either way, you're doing business with the rock, right? Like you're going to do you business with the rock. You don't. <laughs> You don't get away with not doing business with a rock. And and in that season too, for me, you know, I was I was praying, Dr. Lee, I was praying for rest. I was praying for freedom. I was praying for peace. I was praying for clarity of purpose. I mean, I was praying for all these wonderful things, right? Like good things. And I realized in this season, and, and I and I've seen this in different seasons of my life, and I'm sure you've seen this and others listening, you've seen this as well. And hopefully I'm able to. Um, give you language to understand the heart of God. But what I realized, and, and, I, and I write about this in Words with God, but I realized is God won't deliver us from a thing if he knows that that thing will eventually lead us or deliver us to him. Wow. And, and and we have like this idea of freedom and freedom's good. But if we make freedom an idol, then freedom freedom's not good. That's right. And, and so it's, it's this I because otherwise then freedom can be twisted, manipulated, and distorted. And it's this idea with prayer. We we view prayer as a mechanism. Yeah. But the re, but the reality is there's nothing on the other side of prayer. Like you don't you don't use prayer to get to something. If that like, but we treat prayer like that. Prayer is not, there's like nothing on the other side of prayer. Prayer is this constant communion relationship with God. It's yeah. not like we're like, hey, God, give us the answers and get out of our way. God's like, listen, the only reason why I give you purpose, the reason why I, I fill your life with these things is because I want to do this with you. It's like Moses. It's like, God, I don't want the promised land without you. I don't care if you send me in with a warrior angel who takes care of all of our problems. Like, I want yep. you. I want intimacy. I want communion with you, which Dr. Lee, a lot of people struggle with the idea of constant prayer. Right, which yeah. is an invitation that we have in Scripture to ex- to experience this union, right, with um, with the Father, and you know, Paul in First Thessalonians five seventeen and Romans twelve twelve, and we read about this in Ephesians six and other places too. 
this idea of constant prayer, we hear that. We're like, man, because of our idea of prayer, like that's constant bore, constant chore. Like, yeah. what, what do you like constant prayer? This is crazy. Like, how is that even practical? This is like nasal gazing, like, like, gazing, like what is navel gazing? Like, what is this? And I, as I was studying this, as I was, um, you know, over the last several years, as I was studying this, what I, what I came to realize, it's actually an invitation into constant rest. It's yeah. a, a, it's a heart posture of a rest where we're in tune with the spirit, where the dialogue it's, it's open, right? Like so much of prayer is listening, not speaking first. Like everyone just needs to hear that there's you, you should with prayer, spend more time listening than you do speaking just right. for the record. I know a lot of us have this idea of prayer just being things that we say and praying the right things, saying the right things. But the reality is prayer is more about receiving, listening, and, and that's the idea of praying without ceasing is being in tune. And then when we find ourselves in these moments, we can speak with clarity because we're not caught up by the moment. We're actually caught up in the, we're grasped by the presence of God, the faithfulness of God, the communion of God. And that's not, listen, y'all, I, I'm, I'm sharing this from experience. I, I don't claim to be there, right, where I am praying without right. ceasing. But I'll, but I'll tell you this, prayer is a much larger part of my life. And I'm talking about those in-between moments. I'm not talking, of, and do we need quality time in morning, evening? Absolutely, 100%. I'm not saying that prayer doesn't belong in the closet. Like we should pray in closets. We should pray on our knees. We should pray on walks, all those kind of things. But God wants to open the conversation into every part of our lives. And so right. much of us miss out on the robustness of prayer because we still view it as something that can only happen within a closet. Wow. That's, that's exactly right. I, I, I found like over the course of my surgical career, you know, I've, I've had days when I, I said a little prayer on the way to the hospital, let all the surgeries go well today. And then I've had days and seasons where every moment of every operation is a conversation. Mm. Don't cut that. Don't pull on that nerve so hard. Like, like just little, little guidances. And, and, it, yeah. and, and you find, holy cow, I'm in relationship with the Holy Spirit in my occupation right here. Yeah. And it's so yeah. liberating. And, and, and you just, and you find now I'm having a relationship and I may not, it may not solve all my problems, but I'm not alone in those problems. That's, that's, yeah. I think that's where we get to when you were getting to a while yes. ago. Like he, he may not take this tumor away from you. But he may not. He may give you the peace to know that he's going to walk through it with you. Yeah, yeah. Because to your point, what we really crave, what we really crave, what we were made for, is that connection with God. Yeah. Augustine, he put it like this. He said, "Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you." And you look at our world, and you look at like the practices that people are turning to: mindfulness, spoken forgiveness, um, meditation. Yeah, all of these are shadow forms of the robustness that we should be experiencing in prayer. That's exactly, and 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 we have unfortunately we've forfeited so much of of our opportunity to engage with God because we've allowed um, a religious spirit and the um, the code of religion, which basically says you can only engage with God or the gods if you do it on at our time our way through our people. And, and one of the very provocative messages of Jesus's life, like you look at his conversation with the, with the Samaritan woman in John four, she tries to engage him in a religious discourse about where people should worship. Yep. And he flips it on its head. He's like, the time is coming and is even now when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Like yep. this is not about hilltops. This is not about that location or this location. This is about living and within this invitation, like God really does want to connect with us. And the only way that we move out of, um, I should say move through, because I, yeah. I, I want to be careful how I say that. The only way we move through the, the brokenness of our world, even, even when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, we say, lead us not into temptation or trial. Our same Greek word can be translated temptation or trial. Lead us not into temptation, trial. What, what we're actually, people are like, well, shouldn't God keep me from temptation and trial? No, actually, if you dig into the Greek there, what it really means is that essentially what it communicates is that the temptation of the trial is not my final destination. That's right. That there is something on the other side of it. Like God will not leave me there. That is not the end of my story. And 
as we start to realize, man, okay, God, this is so much bigger than what I thought, what I could have constructed as far as religion or what it means to get to God or what it means to be a good person. When we really start to see like God wants to have words with us, we can open up the conversation and have words with God. Wow. So I want to say this earlier, you, you mentioned this season of, of desert sort of that you were in, you weren't sleeping, you were struggling. And I just want the listener to understand like, so Addison's this guy, his his whole life is about the Lord. I mean, you, you work in ministry, your life is about ministry or your organization that you earn your living from is a ministry. Like, so you're not a guy who's in a season of, difficulty and distance from God because you're you're out there living a sinful lifestyle or you've abandoned your faith like like it's important for you to know listener you can be in pursuit of a relationship with the Lord and still have a season like Addison did where you're hurting and it doesn't feel close and so address that for just a second I think it's important yeah and I and I met and I mentioned this earlier um but in that season, the father revealed it. Like, there's no way I would have ever been able to write words with God without that season. There's no way. Just God took me to places in him and also revealing things about myself and how all of that connects in the eyes of the people in my world and the stories of the people in my world and then the world beyond that. Um, I realized, Dr. Lee, that it was in a very strange way. It was, it was an answer to prayers that I had been praying to be closer to God. Wow. Um, I was, pers- I was pursuing God faithfully. And I, and that was a part of the reason why I felt so disoriented. But in that season, I realized that there were just things that I had got, to, I had to let go. If I was going to move forward in my relationship with God and experience the closeness and the intimacy that I really desired, there were things that I was going to have to let go. And Dr. Lee, honestly, a lot of the things that I had to let go in that season, they weren't bad, quote unquote, bad things. But yeah. they were good things that were in the wrong place of my life, good things that were in the wrong place. And I realized in that season that the silence, that silence, that even that sense of separation, that, that feeling of separation, it again, it was not rejection. It was an invitation. God yeah. was saying like, hey, I'm inviting you to know me in ways that you haven't known me before because you haven't had to know me like this before. And that's where... Like the cry of Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That that language that we're invited to participate in and move through, it leads to this reality that God does not abandon the afflicted in their affliction. That's right. And I make this statement in the book, but really like we can't know just how faithful God is until life has given us reason to doubt his faithfulness. That's right. And and we go into new levels and depths of confidence and conviction and assurance and the faithfulness and the goodness of God and the hope that we have, which one of the reasons why I'm so excited about your new book coming out in July, Hope is the First Dose, Thank you. which I can't wait to get my hands on it. Um, I got to read, I got to read a PDF <laughs> word. It was word or PDF. I can't remember which PDF, one, yeah. which is not, it was PDF, which is just not, it's not the same. So nope. I can't wait to get my hands on it, but hope, hope. Faith, those things are cultivated in us as we enter the tension, as we move through the disconnect and the dissonance. And so that's what I would encourage y'all. If y'all are out there and you're like, man, I feel like there's this separation. I don't know what I've done. I would tell you, listen, this is an invitation. This is an invitation to let go of some preconceived ideas. Obviously, if there's sin in your life, sin separates and sunders, right? Like sin, the effects of sin, separation. That's why. Paul makes the statement in 2 Corinthians 5 that God is not counting their sins against them. He talks about how in Christ, God is reconciling the world to yeah. him, right? And we are to be ambassadors of a message, message of reconciliation, but sin separates. And so if you do have sin and you know it, like bring that to the yeah. Father. Confess to God. Confession is not a, a transactional discipline for God. Confession is for us. Like we think confession is for God. The reality is confession is for us. God already knows. That's right. Confession That's is right. for us. Confession is us being able to articulate it, surrender it, and really submit a lie about who we are. Because the enemy will try to come in and say, you made a mistake. You are a mistake. So confession empowers us to surrender a lie that is not all a lie. Because every lie has an element of truth to the truth that is all true. Because it is 
in, in God, it is the truth. That's right. And the lie that the enemy will try to stick to us based on something that we've done, something that we've missed, which is true, that lie is exposed in the presence of the truth. And that's why we go to God and confess. So that's what I would share. Wow. <laughs> you keep giving me these, like we could take these <laughs> tangents and, and talk another hour. I'm going to, I'm going to come home. I'm going to bring it home. Cause I promise you 30 to 45 minutes and you're on the beach with your four kids and your whole family. And we're not going to take your whole afternoon. Oh, I want to, I hey. just want to, I want to tell you this, like you wrote about how God is a consuming fire and the, the, we can go mm. through these periods of our life when it feels like we're in the fire, in the furnace. And Timothy Keller wrote about suffering. He said, sometimes suffering happens to, so that suffering can put its fingers around good things that we've got the wrong relationship with. And that's what you just said. Mm-hmm. Like, like, So sometimes we mm-hmm. go through this consuming fire, but what's the unique thing about God when he puts us in a consuming fire? Yeah. So w- one of the ways I like to describe this is the fire of God is unlike normal fire in the sense of the closer you get to it, the less it burns. That's right. When we, when we run, when we run from the process, when we don't surrender to what God is doing in that process, it hurts. Life hurts. It burns. I mean, Jesus makes the statement that everyone will be salted with fire. Yep. God, God said about Paul, um, to, uh, to Ananias said, I, I will show him how much he must, he must suffer, how much he must suffer for my name. I mean, this is, James writes about it. First, Peter writes about it in first period. I mean, we see it all over the place. Like this is a part of our journey and any, any construct that tries to make sense of life without it is destined to fail. But we do have this promise that in and through the consuming fire, like we are held in the hands of the tender father. Yep. And that we can't let either of those go. He is, and, and, and the Lord's prayer teaches us to pray like this. He is the tender father, our father, right? He's our father. Our father. Who, who has a name, the hallowed name. Hallowed be your name, meaning it's holy. It's other, like he is tender father, but he's also consuming fire. And don't you dare let either one of those go. You got to yeah. hold them in both hands. The certainty and the mystery that come with both of those otherwise you will not be able to navigate the life that we're called to navigate. So, wow. I got good I news. Say. I got good news for the listeners. Your incredible publicist has agreed to give away two copies of words with God. Yeah. Um, Come that's on. just so kind. Uh, so, so the first two listeners hearing my voice right now, send me an email, Lee at Dr. Lee Warren.com Lee at Dr. Lee Warren.com. Please send your mailing address. <laughs> Please send your mailing address. Don't make me write you back. Please email me. And the first two listeners that write in, uh, Addison and his uh, incredibly kind publisher over at Ravel, are going to send two copies of the book. Um, wow. It's going to change lives, Addison. If you got 10 seconds to tell us um, why somebody should read this book, go. Elevator pitch, 10 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. If you've asked yourself, I want to have words with God, but it seems like God doesn't want to have words with me, this is the book for you. If you're... Like I want to pray, but I don't want, I don't know how to do it. And I've tried the formulas. I've tried the quick fixes and they're not working for me. This is the book for you. Incredible. And it really is. I, I said this to you when you honor, one of the great honors of my writing career is you asking me to endorse your book, which I happily did. Um, and I said this to you then, but I've got um, two books on prayer, three books on prayer on my shelf right now, Richard Foster, Phil Yancey, Timothy Keller, and the fourth one is going to be Addison Bevere. It's it's that level um, of an instruction manual. It's not very long, 130 pages, I think, 135 pages. Um, it will change your prayer life. It will change your understanding of what it is, what the conversation is like, what the relationship's like. And it won't leave you the same, just like your book Saints did. I mean, you, I, I came away from Saints with this different understanding of what it meant to be more than just a Christian. And Addison, you're giving us some great tools Um grateful for you and your friendship you, and, and for that little time in the green room back in the day. Um, <laughs> I know. Catalyst luck, for all uh, us. I'm thankful for it. <laughs> amen. God bless you with the book and we're praying for you and your family and go, go hit the beach, man. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Appreciate you. Love you guys. Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together. 
via cell for answer Dr. Lee Warren dot substack dot com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at WLeeWarrenMD dot com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by the great folks over at Tommy Walker Ministries dot org. Check it out and consider supporting them. Tommy Walker Ministries dot org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.